sitting here on a park bench outside one of our excellent small town libraries on Whidbey Island in Washington. And I'm looking here at photographs of John Watson and Margaret Floyd Washburn. And this segment is on the ideas of John Watson versus Margaret Washburn. And I've taken a photograph of Watson to be um, him as a younger man, about the time he would have been at Johns Hopkins, and not the older man who went into advertising, whose picture I had showed previously. And as I mentioned before, uh, Margaret Washburn was the second female president of the APA by 1921 behind uh, Calkins. And the two were not exactly contemporaries, but they were a part of rival schools of American psychology. John Watson and his first wave of behaviorism that arose out of the functional school <clears throat> of Chicago, University of Chicago. Watson came out of that laboratory and uh, migrated to Johns Hopkins where he became chair almost immediately and he became the leader of the behavioral movement uh, by publishing two famous papers in 1913, his A and B paper. One was the Manifesto of Behaviorism and the other was a more directed attack against uh, imagery, the use of imagery in introspective approaches to psychology. That was his B paper. But Watson in those papers, uh, which launched the behavioristic movement before B.F. Skinner ever uh, arrived on the scene two decades later, uh, Watson was launching an attack on Washburn's science of the mind, on her introspectionism or her structuralism, as it came to be known in the 1890s, and it, as it was practiced and propagated at Cornell University by her mentor, Edward Titchener. So what Watson did was he launched an attack against Titchener's psychology, and then Washburn came along later as the ardent defender of that movement by 1920, and she does so in this address. Uh, introspection as an objective method. And I mentioned I gave this article some context last time. Um, and so Watson has succeeded to this point in vaulting his, his behaviorism forward. But now here is uh, Washburn back uh, defending her movement, much in the way that Eric Erickson will defend psychoanalysis against attacks that were leveled against Sigmund Freud um, back in the 50s. Uh, Eric Erickson became the defender of psychoanalysis. And so Washburn's playing that role here. And she says in the paper, I was trained as a structural psychologist and I, I've talked about what this means. Um, but it is heavily steeped in consciousness. And so um, she, she gives a, a sentence here. She says a sentence here, um, structural psychology, in addition to the world of physical science, accepts a parallel or epiphenomenal world of consciousness. The behavioristic metaphysics rejects this conscious concomitant. That's a very sophisticated sentence from Floyd Washburn who is very eloquent in her prose, um, whereas John Watson tends to write like a used car salesman, <clears throat> cobbling together his prose, but getting the job done, getting the job done, saying enough to, uh, to launch his movement in 1913. He's no intellectual equivalent, though, of Washburn. <clears throat> 
example. And so let's let's go back to this sentence and what it what it might mean. She says once again, structural psychology. <clears throat> in addition to uh, a world of physical science, accepts a parallel epiphenomenal world of consciousness. And consciousness is the phenomenon that divides these two schools, behaviorism from introspectionism. And it's more specific than that. So, so Watson's saying consciousness is an epi epiphenomenon. In other words, it is a byproduct of the structural mind that we want to study and that we endeavor to study and whose topics include classic psychological topics such as decision making and human memory and perceptual processes uh, etc those topics the very topics that william james had laid out in his 1890 treatise uh, while he was at harvard the way they're studying these processes is radically different from each other. And so, so Washburn is saying, we need to keep consciousness around for the purpose of studying these topics. For instance, studying imagery and how humans form images <clears throat> and what the quality is of those images. And they view consciousness, the introspectionists did as a tool um, to examine the mind directly and my own advisor at Washington used to say, the introspectionists believe that consciousness provided a conduit to the mind, that a conscious introspection gave a veridical or truthful picture of the contents of the mind, much as a microscope uh, does in looking at uh, what's on the tray or what's on the slide, that there is no distortion to using consciousness to introspect about how these processes work, about what the structure of the mind is. The problem is one in methodology, and this is what Watson pointed out in his paper. He says introspectionism is too subjective in its methodology. We cannot observe, we cannot come to an objective agreement on the contents of an introspectionist mind. And so we have to abandon this methodology. We have to adopt a more objective, observational study of human behavior. So we can't study directly the contents of the mind, such as mental imagery, for instance, which has been a huge topic. And uh, when I came in in the 70s and 80s, it was still a big topic, the use of imagery in mnemonic, uh, mnemonic memory. But Watson says we cannot use consciousness as a tool to introspect about uh, topics such as memory. That doesn't mean we can't study memory. We can, um, and we can study it observationally. We can study it objectively through observing the behavior in a, of an animal, uh, which he experimented with quite a bit at Chicago and, and, and afterwards, um, but also in humans. So we can infer about memorial processes or about decision-making processes, about perceptual processes, purely through observing behaviors. We do not need the introspective tool of consciousness. And so she accuses him of uh, rejecting consciousness and what he's really doing, what Watson's really doing and what he says he will do by 1913 is he's rejecting the methodology that introspectionists had been using for 20, more than 20 years since uh, Washburn's mentor, Titchener, came to America. And it is a revolution and it is a manifesto that he lays out. And by 1920, he has some really solid findings uh, linking emotion, handling emotion in its relation to uh, learning. He's doing this observationally with his subject, his famous subject, Little Albert, um, along with Rosalind Rayner and, um, and Floyd Washburn's science of introspectionism is, is fading and it's being discarded. And at the, she concludes her paper in just such a way uh, to say that you've neglected us and you've ignored us 
and all those things that we that our science has contributed to making psychology a physical science because both of them shared the view that psychology should be more like a physical science and Watson's is very mechanistic more like physics itself and Washburn's was more like chemistry the idea that the elements of the mind could be explored and found out through introspectionism through introspecting about them um, but in a highly trained regimented practice so there are some similarities but also the major differences between these two proponents of their um, sequential movement. Introspectionism came first, was uh, abandoned, and was destroyed by John Watson. And then we move into a 50-year steamrolling of behaviorism. Before the cognitive revolution, we'll do to Watson's behaviorism what he did to the introspectionist before him. So there'll be another revolution by the early 70s. In, by, as early as 1960s. So there's a segment on uh, comparing these two important figures in psychology's history.